Hi, my name is Marina Kuzmenko and I am co-founder of PTO. Today we have our conversation with an interesting guest from Mexico. He is one of the very early adapters of PTO Pro and he is a professor at the University of Veracruz, Jacob Banel Stranger. And he will tell us how he found PTO Pro, how this mobile application helped him in his work with students and research, and a little bit more about the future of our planet and how to feed the population of 9 billion people, which we'll have soon. So let's go! Uh, Jacob, we will uh, have three parts of our conversation just to uh, make a general agenda. So yes. firstly, um, I would like to know about your way. How did you uh, get into agriculture? So how did you, uh, what was the main trigger that you decide to join uh, agriculture, fertilizers and all this stuff? Secondly, it will be interesting for me just to understand how did you discover PTO? and um, about your experience, about your um, wishes, what do you want to have extra more and something, maybe you have some problem which you think that a uh, mobile phone can solve. And finally, we will speak about this big perspective which I mentioned in the email about your view on organic farming or conservative farming or like uh, in your opinion, uh, will we eat only artificial products in 2050s or it will be still natural something but uh, it will be grown vertically so it's just imagination about the future so these yeah. three parts i think it will be quite interesting to listen and again i think uh, since you uh, are a lecturer you have your students it will be just a nice uh, uh, insight about what they need to know and uh, even if we can share this video with them it will be useful for them um sure i think the the topics are great and okay, we'll go through you. through each one of them <laughs> jacob so yeah. tell me about the starting point when did you decide to go to agriculture um, that's a very nice question um i come from a family of scientists actually my mother works in uh, in agriculture as well and she has been working for since I was a little child so I'm very in contact with the fields so from the beginning I knew what I wanted wow. and uh, you, sp you spent your childhood probably not far from the field <laughs> yes I went to the fields I went to the lab since I was a little kid uh, so I was very familiar with the environment and I met a lot of scientists so that's the place where I grew up but the thing that actually made me uh, work in, uh, in agriculture, because I was not uh, sure about it, was when I met uh, a professor that was given a lecture. I was, a, I was 11 years old, I think. And he was talking about the, um, the possibility, all the possibilities that we have by using uh, microorganisms from the soil in order to enrich the... Um, the fertility of the soil. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that made me, okay, this is a, a very nice way to increase productivity as a, as a little child or to produce food by using the same things that we can find in nature. So that's when I really got my head clear about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then After, when you finished yeah. your school, then, oh, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. So then when you finished your school, you probably have a conversation with your mother and she yeah. also <laughs> supported your choice, yeah? Yes, she told me, okay, this, uh, this is going to be interesting because we're going to speak the same language, but uh, okay. yeah, it's up to you. So I decided to study biology and I fell in love with nature. I actually um, work a lot with fungi, fungi in agriculture, and I love it. And actually I have a collection of fungi here in my in my house and afterwards I got the chance to study abroad. Um, where, did you, where did you study? I studied uh, in Denmark mm -hmm. um, and then I got a chance to really see how was, uh, 
agriculture done in another country, especially in Europe, if you compare it to Mexico or to the US, because we had similar systems. That's when I really said, okay, I really want to work in agriculture. This is amazing. I want to implement everything that I learned here back home or mix it to make it more Mexicanized in a way <laughs> to say. Localized. Localized. Yeah, localized. And Jacob, uh, so uh, as I understand it, firstly, went to Veracruz, Veracruzana University. Is it your native university? Yes. Yeah? So you finish this in university or you go to another one? Yes, I did one part in, in Veracruz University. And, oh, Veracruz, yeah. yeah, don't worry. <laughs> and, um, and I went to Oslo University in Norway. Mm -hmm. So I went to both universities to fin finish my bachelor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And uh, then when you uh, came back home, you decided to join the university team as the lecturer, yes? Yes, it was actually um, not in my plan to go back to my home university. Uh -huh. It was just an opportunity that opened and they said there is a position uh -huh. back at the university and it is actually for your profile. So we need someone with these credentials. And I said, okay, I will, I will try to apply and I finally got a job. So uh, it was it was a little bit strange for me because right after I finished my education, I got a job so fast in academia. So this is not very normal. Uh -huh. So I think I, I was uh, lucky for that one. Mm -hmm. So um, you decide to join academia and do not go to commercial sector, yes? And, yes. Uh, I did work uh, before a little bit um, in the private sector, uh -huh. but I didn't... Uh, felt quite comfortable. I really miss being in the lab or working in the fields uh, and working with students as well. So when I joined academia back, I was in my zone, you could say. <laughs> yes, I understand that process. And it is actually helping universities because every semester, my mm -hmm. students use the app for their work. Mm -hmm. Especially now, nowadays is extremely useful because we are teaching virtually. Mm -hmm. So we cannot go to the lab to make some assessments. We cannot use the equipment that we have in the lab to measure leaf area or chlorophyll. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, at least in my, in my classes, um, I give them, as you saw, <laughs> a small video on how to use the app and use it home with their crops. <laughs> Hola, ¿qué tal? Hoy te voy a mostrar cómo de manera muy sencilla puedes utilizar la cámara de un teléfono celular como este para medir el área de una hoja. Y es bastante bueno, de hecho. Mm, ok. And this is like, I was slowly moved to the second point. Of our yes. conversation. We, can, we can continue the first section. <laughs> yes, yes, but we, I'm still interested. So, um, uh, do you have a specific list of crops uh, which you work in at the university or you are just uh, on this semester we work with this crop on the other semester or you have stable like okay we work only with corn and that's it because this is again commercially very profitable <laughs> crop <laughs> so what it's is your, your crop um, we switch between uh, the necessities mm -hmm. each semester right now uh, I am working with my students on what they uh, have in their fields because most of them are uh, come from farm, farming, a farming family, so they'll have already have a land. So each of them have a different crop. So we try to adapt our research to their necessities. But in a broader um, way, I work in a in a research group. Mm. I'm actually the only guy and all the rest are only women. Our boss is also very good. So she oh, usually decides. Because, uh, Jacob, sorry for interrupting me again, but uh, it's a very interesting point because actually agriculture is mainly male-dominated industry. <laughs> and when you, it is. when you say that you are the only man, I'm really curious how it's possible. <laughs> yeah, and if you think about it, we're in Mexico, so that's also not quite common. Oh. Um but uh, in the faculty where I'm working, it, as you said, is mainly dominated by men. 
but the women uh, are uh, gathering together and they made a group. Mm -hmm. And I was honored <laughs> to be welcomed to that group. Um, and uh, our main, um, our PI, mm -hmm. um, she usually like direct where, where our research is going to be made. We are usually uh, focused on crops that are close to our region, my state. Uh, is the is a is a, a very large producer of pineapples. Mm -hmm. So in the southern part, that's where we work the most. In the region where I am based, uh, we have a lot of sugarcane and coffee, uh, and that's where we are working right now mainly. Wow. Okay. And uh, are you applying PTO for sugarcane, coffee, and pineapples? <laughs> yes. Yes, in pineapple, not so much, yeah. but in coffee is extremely useful. Okay. And uh, one of the reasons that I found your, your app on the internet is because I tried to develop my own. Wow. And, and this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you. Uh -huh. Because you said, uh, I, don't, I don't remember where, but you said that in this conversation, we could talk a little bit about some of the futures that could be useful. Yeah. And since I actually don't have time to work on my own app, when I found yours, it was like heaven. It was it was perfect because then it was already well made. It was useful and it was easy to show to my students. So the thing that I used to have in my old app was when you work with coffee, we have this disease called coffee rust. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know how to say that in English, but it's, it's a rust. Mm -hmm. And uh, that rust creates some uh, yellow spots on the leaf. So I want to see the damage on the leaves. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great future if you could see, besides the total area of the leaf, if the app could detect those spots and subtract them from, mm -hmm. from the calculation. Like you have the whole calculation and then you can subtract it. Yeah, I understand. The percentage of damaged area on the leaf, it's one of the one of the quite uh, frequently asked feature. <laughs> yes. feature. But coming back to, to the main question, uh, uh -huh. crops you're, I'm working right now as well is beans mainly because I'm I didn't tell you before I work with biofertilizers, mm -hmm. and, uh, some microorganisms that live in inside uh, the roots of a plant are able to fix nitrogen from from the air, so that's what I'm working like right now, right now with my students. As I told you before, I was trying to develop an app. Unfortunately, I did it on an, an, a not very popular platform, which was a Windows mobile. So all my work was sent to the garbage. So, but uh, we are not very familiar with Windows mobile at all. And how did you do this? Did you use any manual or any instructions? How did you make this? Even, yes, you said maybe it's not the perfect quality, but still, it's kind of completely new area. And, uh... Yes, uh, I think when you, when you start meeting people in academia, you meet people that do different stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to meet someone that was uh, very good on programming. Uh -huh. you know, we, we, we have different fields. One of them is bioinformatics. Okay. Then I met one of them, and then he told me that that there are many ways that bioinformatics can make my life easier uh -huh. or programming. And then he showed me an example on how to program, and I was like, "This is this is not my area. I understand nothing. It looks scary." But he told me, "Don't worry. It looks scary at the beginning, but it's easy, and it makes your life easier." And then he showed me basics, and then from from there. You just use Google and then you go to Stack Overflow and then you go to GitHub and then you just try to, to copy one part of someone and then to apply it to yours and then you see if it works or you can make it better in less lines. So mm -hmm. it was nice, but that's not my field. So I thought that it was easier just to find someone that was an expert. Mm -hmm. And I tried to hire someone to do it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I found your app and then it was like, okay, mm -hmm. I, I will just uh, go for this. This is way better than I thought or than my idea. So uh, it's, it, it's it working. It is, um, 
It is reliable, so the measures are reliable because I tested it. I want also to ask you, and um, so you have students, uh, and you say, speak to them, you advise to use PTO Pro, and uh, how do they react? Are they uh, like accepting it without any problems, or they are just saying, oh, what uh, terrible stuff, you need to use mobile phones for our agriculture? So, do you have any problems with bringing new technology to students or not? Yes, <laughs> I have some challenges, as you said, uh -huh. uh, but it depends. As I told you before, I, in these moments where we have this virtual classes, uh -huh. they find it useful. At the beginning, when I was in front of a class and I was showing them how to use it, they were like, mm, not so sure about why to use it because they are very used to go to fields, use their hands. Technology here, even though we have access to it, it's not so difficult for farmers. They are still not using it. They really like the old ways or, mm -hmm. or the way that the parents taught them how to use. But some of them, and that's the interesting part, some of them are eager to show their parents that they can do something for their land. Like, I, 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 you know that I can apply these that I learned at the university or I can do this better because I found this and I can use satellite image to do this and I can use this phone and you can get a lot of information. And, and they are very eager just to show their parents that they learn something new that can help their farms. Mm -hmm. And these are the students that I actually focus the most and I really like to work with. Because they are, as you said, the ones that have a vision and how technology can help uh, uh, to produce food, not only just to, to know certain information, but to get to, to be more efficient at producing certain crop. That's, that's the, this, those are the students that I really like to work with because they have this, this vision as, as yours, as you said. Uh, yes, and about the vision. So... Let's speak about the vision, uh, your, your, your opinion and your attitude towards uh, this very hype topic of organic farming and uh, or you, you prefer still uh, traditional ways of farming when you are doing tillage and you are doing all like uh, chemicals and what is your way? Because I understand that you have quite a lot of uh, insights and the strong history very it's an easy and a complex question at the same time it's an easy if you are a farmer and if you want to sell if you go you want to go to to these retail stores that are very large where you get to a lot of people especially in big cities like the one i am right now because people are looking for these new trends on how to produce and i use the trend the, the word trend not lightly because i am like many other agriculture scientists in the field, we know how the food is produced. So um, I am not into this organic uh, movement. I am more into the sustainable agriculture movement. Mm -hmm. Because for me and for many of my colleagues uh, in the area, organic, it seems more like a, like a brand. Mm -hmm. Uh, than a, a vision. I know that many people are holistic about it, but when, especially when I was studying in Denmark, that was part of my education. Denmark is actually one of the countries where you go to a supermarket and 90% of the food is completely organic. Wow. But they have, they have another word. It's not organic. It's ecological, which I like to use most. Uh, and I saw uh, how organic farmers produce their food. And for me, it was... It was not about sustainability. It was about um, a brand. So mm. if you have a field and you cannot apply uh, herbicides to get rid of, of plants that you don't want, of weeds, um, you cannot use chemicals. So what they used was uh, a flame drawer. Mm -hmm. You know, with fire, they burn the field. And I was so shocked how, many, how much energy they use just to get rid of that in order to get the label. It says organic footprint. certified. Yes, eh? carbon, carbon footprint is, yes. I think, it's over 
then yes, I understand that it's kind of a race for for, for trend. It's for for instance, we we produce here uh, organic coffee. Uh, uh -huh. We're well, Mexico is one of the largest organic coffee producers, so we export a lot of coffee to different regions, uh -huh. and that also leaves a, a very large car carbon footprint. So I'm more, I am more focused on, on sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I think organic is fine. I, am, uh, I think industrialized is fine. I think technical is fine, agriculture. Mm -hmm. As long as you know how to use it. It's just a toolbox. It's a toolbox where you have uh, tools and depending on what do you need, depending on your needs of mm -hmm. your, your country, the, the amount of resources that you can use, the money, you can choose from that tool, toolbox and then apply it to your reality. Uh, in Mexico, we cannot afford organic food because it's very expensive. Sometimes it's seven or 10 times more expensive. So it's, it's more um, like a status here. Only the rich, the richest people can afford it. And sometimes it's just, it's just about bragging how I am helping and you can't. But we can't because we cannot access to that. So for me, it's just produce the most amount of food in the smallest area of land in a way that can allow you to keep producing for several years, years without causing a largest damage. If you talk to a farmer, that's what they, are, they really want. Okay, I want to keep producing, don't destroy the soil, so I can keep earning money. At the end, it's just about how they can survive. Yes. And, and what is your opinion about the uh, in these all movements? Uh, is it is it possible to feed the planet uh, in twenty fifty when it will be nine billion people? And uh, uh, what, what innovative ways of agriculture, in your opinion, uh, can help to reach the goal and not so many people will be hungry? That's uh, I think that's the question that most of agricultural science scientists have before they go to sleep <laughs> uh, and you're we are not uh, speaking about simple questions our goal is the hardest one <laughs> yes um actually in, in in two weeks from now i'm going to give a, a small talk about something called the planetary boundaries i don't know if you have ever heard about it a little bit hurt but not so deep as you are <laughs> yes so we have this this boundaries of, of how many resources or we can use on earth and some of them are already like beyond recovery like biodiversity is, is getting lost um, there's a lot of co2 uh, the soil is getting eroded and so on but what i am the most interested on is phosphorus and it goes with your question is because there is a planetary boundary that it's them the where we get our fertilizers it doesn't matter if it's agriculture uh, organic ag agriculture or traditional traditional both of them will need fertilizers it's not very easy to get them especially phosphorus because it comes from a mineral rock called rock phosphate so the largest mines are in morocco and they are running out so we are reaching a peak in 2030 i think that's the, um, the peak where we will get the most amount of phos rock phosphate and then it will start declining so it's a limited resource and the amount of food we need to produce is, is larger every day because we have more people, less arable land, mm -hmm. uh, and we will have less, less fertilizer. doesn't matter if it's organic or not. You need mm -hmm. to use that fertilizer. So one of the things that I'm working on right now, or, or the group that I'm working now, it's what we can do about this. Mm -hmm. So that's where biotechnology gets into the play. Uh, and that's where our job, our work, our research gets into the play. We work with biofertilizers. It's not about organic or holistic way of producing. It's just about these microorganisms that live in the soil that are able to get the nutrients that are locked in the soil to the plant. So you don't need to apply more. You just need to apply just a little bit and these microorganisms will be able to transport these nutrients in a more efficient way to the plant. And 
uh, one of the microorganisms that I work the most and I have been working all my life mm -hmm. are called mycorrhiza. Uh -huh. It's a fungi that has a symbiotic relationship with plants, with 90% of the plants. So if we know how to apply them, we can save up to 80 to 90% of fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. Oh. So it doesn't matter if you apply organic or uh, synthetic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So you have to use less. That means less energy, less pollution, less waste of nutrients or money or whatever. But that's a way where we can fight this, this future, not so futuristic problem mm -hmm. about how we can feed the world with less, by, but by producing more. And it's a way how to make sustainable agriculture, in fact. Because yes, it's about sustainability. Yeah, our sustainability. This is not our idea. I think the research on mycorrhiza has been there for more than 40 or 60 years. Uh -huh. It's nowadays that we have more tools to study them because they are microscopic organisms. They are okay. around 300 microns. So they are very, very small. So they're not very easy to produce. They cannot grow in a petri dish, for instance, because they are obligate symbionts. They need a plant to, to reproduce. And uh, our PI, which <laughs> is also my mother. <laughs> ah, okay. So you, you have uh, easy uh, uh, contact with your PI. <laughs> yes. It was not my goal, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. But she's actually, she has been working with that for ages. And she's the first, the founder of the um, Mexican Society for Mycorrhizal Studies. Ah, okay. The, um, the study of mycorrhizae or this kind of microorganisms, like formally, mm -hmm. started probably 30 years ago in a more connected way. So we have connections in, in the US. We, we know people in the UK, for instance. We know people in Denmark, in Spain especially, that work on that field. And there are not so many. So we know each other. Every conference we go, we know each other for years. I know we know our names. We're more friends than than colleagues. I understand. It's like a big village. Everyone yes. know each other, but it's a village of microrise. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, the information is there, and we are going very fast, especially now with biotechnology, with with the new with new methods in biotechnology like sequencing, next generation sequencing. Uh, transcriptomes, genomes, and so on. And with internet, we can uh, we can exchange our our data, mm -hmm. and we can also exchange our methods on how to apply them. So it's not something from us; it's something that started several years ago, but now it's it's being applied faster. And we it's very hard to to provide a new technology to farmers. Because when you arrive with something new, like a biofertilizer, for them, when they listen to this name, biofertilizer, the thing is something like related to organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, that sounds kind of hippie and they don't want to get it. Like, this is not about that. It's, it's about you reducing the amount of, uh, of resources or input into your field. So you're going to save money mm -hmm. without destroying the soil. <laughs> So we try to, to get to each farmer, but it's very difficult. Not many people want to. That's where our job at the university starts because the, the, the sons or the daughters of these farmers, they really want to, to impress their parents. They, they start to apply this biotechnology. Uh, but the thing is, there are not so many companies that produce this biofertilizer. So we have to do it ourselves. So we have a, a small project on on a sort of larger medium scale mm -hmm. that produces around 30 tons per year of biofertilizers and we try to distribute it to farmers, uh, at least in our state, in a symbolic way because we, we are not businessmen. We are scientists. We don't know how to make. We are returning to the point of our conversation. You know, yes. at the beginning we were chatting about commercial <laughs> stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I so, know. We are not businessmen. We are scientists. So we want this technology. We want that our research gets to where it's needed, to the field. So we sell this to the farmers, and then they, they, they apply it 
and they buy it just to a fraction of the cost, like it costs five times less, but no less quality because we have a lab, a high quality lab where we make our, our um, quality controls. And they can use it because it's cheaper mm-hmm. compared to what we find in the market that comes from abroad, for instance, by fertilizers that come from Europe or from, from France or from the United States. It's better just to use homemade uh, science <laughs> and then apply it. And local production is always better than uh, yes. something which is imported and uh, in many ways it's better. Yes, yes. you are right. And uh, is there any any way how PTO Pro can help with micro rice um, research or anything? Because we want to, to, to help this global movement uh, to, to, to solve the problem, which actually will be not in 2050, but as I heard from you, in 2030, when yes. the level of phosphorus will be peak and then go down. So it's actually yeah. even the solution must be found faster. So yes. in your opinion, uh, is Petiol helpful for, for, for this kind of research? Yes, and actually yesterday I was talking with one of my students that is using the app, uh-huh. the Pro, and she told me, uh, Professor, I, I have been working with my experiment and I show my dad, because one thing is, is go to the fields and see the plants. Uh-huh. But then with this, she can show her dad a small graph. I have been taking pictures and I have been able to to get some data, some information about uh, the growth of the of the of the plant by leaves, or the amount of nitrogen, which is extrapolated with the amount of chlorophyll that you get, so that means more production. So she showed her dad a graph on how fast it is growing her plant, or how m- how much chlorophyll the plant is getting, um, and that will translate in the future in a larger production. But by using technology, by using Petiol Pro, she was able to convince her dad to start using biofertilizers like my price. Nice. Good chain, good chain. Yes. Um, so that's the way that is helping us, is just to convince, to get data, to get the data that we really want mm-hmm. to convince farmers to integrate new technologies, not only um, biofertilizers, but to get the tools to understand how they work. Wow. Yeah. So, thank you so for so much inspiration. Finally, if you are a student, a PhD candidate or a researcher at the university or any educational institution around the world, you can get PTO Pro for free. To get more information about this offer, you can go to the special webpage, link is provided below or use this QR code.